Coming up on this episode of Linux for Everyone, a quick look at a recently introduced feature on Deepin that every single desktop Linux distribution really needs to have, and one of them is definitely working on. Plus, I'm going to talk about my Linux toolkit and invite you to do the same. And then we're going to round things out with a project that I'm sort of rebooting, and I'll explain that and get into the first distro under the microscope. Plus, another community-submitted Linux origin story, and another song from the source. Episode 13 starts right now. Hi, this is Dave, and we are listening to Linux for Everyone in the United Kingdom. Welcome home. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Linux for Everyone, the podcast about desktop Linux, open source software, and gaming and music and community and all kinds of exciting stuff. Right off the bat, I want to say that you can expect an episode that's a little more lighthearted this week. I know that with episode 12 and the discussion about flagship Linux hardware and Linux marketing sucks and (laughs) all of that, it uh, it was a bit heavy. And this week, I just wanted to have a little more fun. So let's get into our discovery of the week. And this is, I guess I'm kind of cheating here because it's not as much of a discovery for me. Uh, I covered this at Forbes a few months ago, but I've been kind of in this um, this kick lately where I'm exploring all these backup utilities and uh, sync solutions and just ways to make transitioning from distro to distro or desktop to desktop a little bit smoother and easier. So earlier this summer, Deepin introduced a little feature called Deepin Cloud Sync, which lets you basically sync all kinds of system settings up to the cloud automatically. So we're talking about network settings uh, like VPN and Wi-Fi, your sound settings, your mouse settings, your update preferences, your power management uh, settings, your uh, corner settings, you know, the hot corners, your theme, your wallpaper, your launcher, your dock preferences, all that stuff that you're investing time into tweaking and configuring with pretty much any new installation. Now, I love stuff like this because it's really appealing to newcomers and and more casual Linux users, and it's also really appealing to people who just like saving time. The downside of this, if there is a downside, is that you do need to have something called a Deepin ID. Now, I know in the past there was some controversy surrounding Deepin. You had some light telemetry that was available in the Deepin software store that was not disclosed to the public. Uh, but, you know, I really love Deepin. I, I don't know why I'm, de- I don't know why it's not my daily driver because it's so beautiful. I think it is still the most beautiful, elegant, and just slick, modern looking. Linux desktop distribution. And that's the one that I really like to show people when they say, oh man, Linux is just ugly. I'm like, oh no, it's not. Take a look at this. So the point of me bringing this up here isn't, isn't to say that, hey, everybody install Deepin Desktop Environment and use this. There's obviously other solutions, homegrown solutions. Um, you know, you can just back up all your stuff to a GitHub repo. You can use Nextcloud, things like that. But I wanted to mention that the folks over at Ubuntu Budgie are essentially working on a script that will allow you to save these very same preferences and settings and themes and such without having to rely on a cloud-based infrastructure. So right now, if I'm not mistaken, there is some code being worked on over at Team Budgie. And then down the road, a a GUI tool will hopefully be developed to complement it. But what's really nice is that Budgie will collect all the settings for you and then let you choose, hey, how do you want to back this up? Do you want to use Google Drive? Do you want to use NextCloud? Do you want to do local storage? Do you want to do network storage? And I think that's a really, really cool solution. I don't have a lot of details on it yet, but it's it's just a general feature that I, I think would be 
very advantageous to have as just a default feature on every desktop Linux distribution, especially, you know, call it the distro hopper feature if you want. Um, uh, but, you know, it, for those of us who like to nuke and pave, uh, for those of us who might have, for example, multiple installations of either Ubuntu or Mint or Pop! OS on various machines, and we want to keep those perfectly in sync with each other. But yeah, Deepin Cloud Sync, if you want to check it out, uh, it's available in Deepin 15.11. Interestingly, when I wrote about this, it um, it made mention of it only being available in mainland China and coming to other regions soon. So I might actually revisit this and see if it has expanded out of China yet. But you know, if you guys have some elegant solutions for uh, syncing all of those settings that you've that you've honed and perfected and and that you want replicated on every machine you have, pop me an email, linuxforeveryone at pm.me. And if I see some really cool ones that aren't super complicated, I'll try them out myself and I'll share it on the show. And now, the fastest housekeeping segment ever on Linux for Everyone. Get ready. If you want to be part of this awesome community on Telegram, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Mastodon, all you need to know is this. Linux, the number four, everyone. That is Linux, the number four, everyone. I'd love to see you there. I know that our community would love to see you there as well. The Telegram group in particular, almost 500 members strong already, and it is just a rowdy blast all day, all night over there. And finally, I just want to say thank you to my 62 patrons who generously support this show with their wallets. And that's it. Housekeeping's done. All right, so I got an email from Steve last week, and he was wondering if I had ever published, you know, my my Linux tool bag, my my tools and software that I use on a daily basis, and I haven't, and I think that's a great idea, but before I publish it somewhere, I wanted to talk about it here. So I spent a few minutes this morning just rounding up everything that I use on a regular basis, and I've kind of broken it up into three categories, podcasting, general and, and work and productivity, and uh, gaming. Now, for the podcast, for those curious, I use Audacity. That's all I need to do this show. Recording it, editing it, exporting it. It's a brilliant piece of software. It's lightweight. It's easy. It's reliable. It's stable. I love it. On the hardware side, I record the show and do the majority of everything on my System76 Oryx Pro. And uh, as far as actual podcasting equipment, I use an MXL BCD1 microphone and a Zoom U22 audio interface because that is basically plug and play on everything. And now sometimes, sometimes I use a service called Auphonic, which is really quite impressive. For example, it sort of saved episode 11's interview with uh, Artyom Zorin because I made a somewhat fatal mistake with the uh, recording quality on that interview. And believe me, it sounded a lot worse before I ran that through Auphonic. I don't use it all the time, uh, but it's it's one of those lifesavers if you need it. It takes any audio file and runs it through a series of very complex algorithms that uh, you can tailor specifically for podcasting. And so it'll do things like um, noise reduction, and it will apply compression, and it'll make all the the vocal levels just loud enough and just very consistent across the board. But I think the the true usefulness of Auphonic is the fact that you can plug in your audio file, and then you can add all the metadata, you can add album art, you can add chapters that will get injected into the outputted uh, file. 
you can have it converted into a video with kind of a, an EQ visualizer on the video. You can spit it out into multiple audio formats and multiple encoding rates and just uh, like all kinds of stuff. So you can do that. It's, it's really nice for batch audio editing. Anyway, I've spent far too long talking about Auphonic. So let's get into some general day-to-day -day stuff. And I'll preface this by saying that probably 80% of the software here has come from you, has come from the community as suggestions. And I am super grateful for that. For the occasional non-Forbes blogging that I do over at ditchwindows.com, I'm not even sure I've mentioned that domain name here before. Uh, it's, it's sadly a little bit neglected, and I, I really need to give it more attention because it's just an awesome domain name, right? Anyway, over there, I have a digital ocean droplet with a uh, installation of Ghost, and Ghost is an open source blogging platform that's really, really just streamlined and super easy to use. On all of my systems and my phone, I have standard notes. And I'm going to give a shout out to Alan Pope for putting that one on my radar because, I mean, anytime I have an idea anywhere, I just write it down. And you can uh, assign tags to certain things. You can pin certain notes. You can do a lot with the free version. So definitely check it out. Standard notes. It runs on everything. Right now for keeping things like my... Um, music projects and source file, you know, master files for the podcast and all the songs from the source and all the the welcome home tags and everything, everything really, everything on my computer. I use Sync Thing, so any kind of important documents, projects, music, photos, Sync Thing is brilliant, and it's very easy to set up. And there's a uh, local. GTK user interface for it, and there's also a web interface for it. And then for backing up all that stuff to Google Drive, I'm using Deja Dupe right now, which is I just schedule once a day, and I just kind of set it and forget it. In a perfect world, I would have a uh, Nextcloud instance set up at DigitalOcean, and you know all my own homegrown <laughs> cloud backups, but that's it's a bit of a time-consuming project, I think. But it, it's definitely on my radar. That's something that I want to accomplish at some point in the near future. I've got uh, Mumble installed for the occasional interview and also for chatting with the community over at the Destination Linux Network. And yes, there is a room just for Linux for Everyone listeners, and that is over at mumble.destinationlinux.network. For spreadsheets and, and general article writing, LibreOffice is my go-to software. If I want to do some quick screen captures of something, maybe a, you know I notice a bug or I just want to show something cool to the, to the community, I use an app called Peek. That's P-E-E-K. And this is nice because you can record the screen or a section of the screen or a particular window as a GIF, as an MP4, or in WebM format. And then for screenshots, I use Deepin Screenshot. All right, moving on to the gaming. So I do most of my gaming on the Oryx Pro. It's got an RTX 2070, so it's, uh, it's more than powerful enough to play anything at 1080p, high or ultra. And I'm very, very happy with that in terms of gaming. Uh, but I also have a Falcon Northwest Talon with a Ryzen 9 3900X, 32 gigs of RAM, dual RTX 2080 Supers, and that thing is just a ridiculous beast, and I'm very close to... Now, this is a review system, and uh, sadly, I'm still using Windows on it, but once I wrap up that Windows review, I'm going to throw some Linux on it and do some comparisons and really just work that thing to death and see how much I can do with that 12 core Ryzen processor and, the, and that 32 gigs of RAM. That's going to be a blast. As far as software goes on the gaming side, I use OBS for any streaming or recording. For example, during uh, our community game nights, and there's another one coming up later this month. So I'll talk about that probably next week. Lutris, of course, Game Hub, which was also a discovery of the week, and Steam, obviously, for, you know, both native Linux games and uh, and for Proton stuff. And, you know, as far as as far as like controllers, keyboard, mouse, things like that, I don't really have a preference. I have a, uh, a Zotac gaming keyboard 
that has cherry blue switches, and I just love the clicky sound of cherry blue. Um, but when I'm hopping between all these systems that I'm evaluating constantly, I have a pair of Logitech peripherals. Uh, the Logitech keyboard is a K375S. It's not the most brilliant keyboard if you're doing a lot of marathon typing or coding, but if you're just going back and forth between systems and uh, you know benchmarking or just writing some things here and there, it's really, really nice. It's got up to three profiles that you can use for Bluetooth, and it also has a direct RF connection. And then on the mouse side, I have a Logitech MX Master, which also has three Bluetooth profiles. So I just have these side by side. And, and if I'm switching back and forth, you know, I can just click it over to one or click it over to two or click it over to three and just be working on the system that they are connected to. And my controller of choice is the Xbox One S. And that's honestly more about comfort and less about functionality. Although I do really like that I can sync it up uh, via Bluetooth as well. And I think that covers at least most of the prominent hardware and software that I use on a daily basis. So that's, that's kind of my Linux toolkit as it stands right now. But I want to hear about yours. Let's do that for next week's Community Voice segment. I want to hear about your absolutely essential software and hardware that you use on a daily basis that you couldn't live without. No rules really for how long this uh, voicemail needs to be. Maybe keep it under two minutes if you can. Don't worry about the audio format. You can just record it using uh, any microphone that you have at your disposal and email that to Linux for everyone at PM. Dot M-E. And I will play some of the best ones on next week's episode 14. So towards the beginning of 2019, I embarked on what was uh, probably too ambitious of a project called the Linux Gaming Report. And that was going to be a nine or 10 article series over at Forbes that had three specific goals. Number one was to meticulously document the entire installation and setup procedure that's necessary to achieve stable gaming on Steam, and that's for both native and Proton games across a variety of Linux distributions. Number two was that I wanted to discover any notable differences in performance across those Linux distros. And number three, and this to me was the most important goal, was to contribute potentially valuable insights to both the Linux community and the developers making these distributions with um, kind of an eye on improving the average user's gaming experience on Linux. This turned out to be an extremely time-consuming little project. I got about four articles in. I covered Fedora 29, Pop! OS 1810, Solus 4, and Manjaro 18. And I think that when I approached this, I did not realize how fast the Linux world moves, how fast improvements are made across the kernel and in wine and drivers and everything in that entire ecosystem. And I dropped the ball. Well, now I'm picking the ball back up. And I'm going to get through as many of these distros as I can before the, the Linux landscape fundamentally changes again. Beyond those three goals, I wanted this series to serve as a sort of guide for newcomers who might be choosing a popular distribution like Linux Mint or Ubuntu or Manjaro or Fedora. And so what I did is I looked at what is the gaming experience out of the box? How do you install Steam? Is Steam already installed? Are there multiple versions to consider? What do I have to do to get my NVIDIA graphics card up and running? What do I have to do to get my Radeon card up and running? Do I need to install 32-bit Vulkan libraries? 
Are some of the world's most popular controllers going to work out of the box? Will Steam Proton games work out of the box? There are a lot of variables when it comes to gaming on Linux. But I wanted to simplify it all, and I wanted to kind of create this blueprint, this guide, and also, honestly, assign some grades. Say, hey, you're doing this exceptionally well. Over here, though, you really need some improvement. You need some some usability tweaks. You need more updated drivers, things like that. And I want to add a few observations into the mix as well. You know, are things like GameHub and Lutris and Play on Linux, are those available in the distro software store? Or do I have to add a PPA and, and manually install those? That's not, by any stretch of the imagination, a difficult thing to do, but it's not something that I want to ask a new Linux user to do. So the very first Linux distribution up on the rebooted Linux Gaming Report test bench is Linux Mint 19.2 Cinnamon Edition. Here's the test bench I'm working with for this entire series. An AMD Ryzen 7 3700X, 8-core CPU, an Asus Republic of Gamers Crosshair 8 Hero Motherboard, <gasps> take a breath, 16 gigabytes of system memory, and two graphics cards. The AMD Radeon RX 580, this is the Sapphire Nitro, and on the NVIDIA side, an Asus GTX 1060. And this is not about crowning a champion on the GPU side in terms of performance. It's, it's more about using two similarly specced graphics cards. Even though they're not identical, they should offer roughly the same performance at 1080p. But what will be interesting is seeing if there are any huge performance disparities on certain games or benchmarks with these two cards. And then over time, as more distributions are evaluated, it'll be really interesting to track how the performance on one card may increase or drop within that same hardware environment. Okay, so Linux Mint 19.2 Cinnamon Edition, it ships with a fairly old kernel. It's kernel 4.15. And on the AMD side, that means you have the built-in Mesa driver, and that is version 19.0.8, which is also, I guess in the grand scheme of things, fairly outdated. Stable, yes, but a bit old. Now, I mention this next part frequently because I have to, I have to bear in mind that maybe not everyone listening to the show is a Linux veteran. Maybe some people are still kind of hanging out on the sidelines. Maybe some people are brand new. But the cool thing about using a AMD Radeon graphics card with Linux is that the graphics driver is built into the kernel. You don't have to go somewhere to a website to radeon.com and install software for it. It's just built in and it, it works out of the box. On your first boot, you can install Steam and start gaming or Lutris or you know whatever open source games you might have, good old games, that kind of stuff. On the NVIDIA side, this changes fairly dramatically, which I think adds to some of the confusion for new users. Now, there is an open source driver called Nouveau, which is built into the kernel, but it's not nearly as performant as NVIDIA's proprietary driver. I mean, if you're playing anything remotely modern, you're going to want that proprietary NVIDIA driver. And the methods for obtaining that vary from distro to distro, which is also something that I'll be uh, explaining as we go along. Linux Mint makes this fairly easy. Once you've got the system installed, all you have to do is go to Driver Manager, and in my experience, it will show you the driver that you're currently using, which, if it's a new installation, will be the Nouveau driver. And then it will also display an older and newer proprietary NVIDIA driver, and it'll come with a recommendation. So I was recommended to install NVIDIA driver 430.26. So I clicked it, I hit apply, I waited for it to do its thing, I restarted the PC, and boom, I've got a gaming ready driver. So that's nice to see. You know, no, uh, no PPAs needed, no manual installs, obviously no compiling stuff from the source, that's, that's not necessary. Okay, so our graphics cards are ready to rock. Now what about Steam? 
Steam is not pre-installed, but it is available in Linux Mint's software store. There's actually two versions of Steam available. There is, of course, the distro-supplied version, and there is a Flatpak version. Now, your mileage may vary, but in my experience, I find it much easier to go with the version of Steam that my distribution has supplied. The flat packs are nice, but in this case, I sometimes use uh, a game library that's on a secondary drive. And using the flat pack, since that's kind of a sandboxed environment, you might have some difficulty with permissions. And there are, of course, workarounds to that, but I like to keep it simple. So I go with the distro maintained version of Steam. Now, if you're firing up a fresh installation of Linux Mint 19.2, you should have no issues with native Linux games on Steam, but you might have a, a serious issue trying to run those Windows games via Proton. Because from what I can tell, Linux Mint does not automatically download and install uh, the Vulkan 32-bit libraries, which are needed for Proton. Now, Pop! OS does this. And that's a really that's just one of the reasons that I'm on Pop OS as my daily driver. It's those thoughtful considerations that they have made, you know, that, that reduce the amount of time needed to get up and running and um, reduce the, the overall steps involved. Now, I'm fairly sure that these libraries are included with the NVIDIA proprietary driver, but not with the AMD Mesa driver. So in the event that you're on any distro and you just can't seem to fire up those Proton games, you'll need to fire up Terminal and type sudo apt install mesa-vulcan-drivers, mesa-vulcan-drivers, colon, i386. Again, it, it's a simple procedure, but it's not something that a beginner would know about. There seem to be a few other oddities as well. Uh, one example is I tried plugging in my Nintendo Switch Pro Controller via USB, and it just simply was not detected by Steam. So then I moved over to my two Pop! OS installations on different machines, plugged it in, and boom! Steam came up with the notification, hey, are you using a controller? Go into the Steam Controller config, it's right there, you can set it up, calibrate it, all that goodness. Now, a plus side for Linux Mint is definitely this. The Update Manager has a wonderful, easy tool for upgrading the kernel. And since this is a bit behind, uh, out of the box it's 4.15, I decided to just do that and upgrade to kernel 5.0. And yes, I'm sure I could solve this problem. I'm sure that the answer is out there. I could do the research. But that's not really the point of, of what I'm trying to accomplish here. I'm trying to illustrate uh, what a distro does really well and what hurdles it represents for people coming to that distro for the first time or people coming to Linux for the first time. One of the other things I'm doing with this uh, Linux Gaming Report distro evaluation is selecting a couple Proton games and just seeing if they run out of the box. So those two games are Wolfenstein 2, The New Colossus, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider. And I'm happy to say that Wolfenstein 2 runs like a dream right out of the box. No tweaking necessary, it just works. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, on the other hand, did not work on both the AMD and NVIDIA cards. It did not work with both versions of the kernel. It did not work on at least three of the various Proton versions that I tried, it just won't launch. And again, I didn't have this issue with, uh, I believe it was Ubuntu and Pop! OS. Both of these games just fired up and ran. So I'm not sure what's happening there, but again, it'll be interesting to track how this plays out as we go across multiple distributions. Now, I don't want you guys to think that I'm trying to disparage the, the Linux Mint developers. In fact, I have a lot of positive things to say about it. This is probably the most time I've ever spent with Linux Mint, and it is beautiful. I really love the Cinnamon desktop. It, it feels familiar. It feels snappy. Everything is where I expect it to be. The, even the, you know, the default uh, desktop wallpaper is beautiful. The notifications are nice. It's just a shame that it's not tuned a little bit more precisely for gaming. But I am going to spend some more time with it, and I will have 
a very exhaustive write-up over at Forbes probably in the next few days, so keep a lookout for that. Uh, you can follow my personal Twitter at KillYourFM, and I'll have it posted there as well. And in case you're curious, the next distribution on the test bench for this series will be Ubuntu Mate 19.10. So stay tuned. This week's Linux origin story comes from you. If you head over to discourse.destinationlinux.network, you'll find a thread that I started where you can share your story as well, and I'll read some of the best ones right here on the show. This one comes courtesy of Min Yan. My best friend and I were in middle school when the movie Hackers came out in 1995. I remember being so awestruck by that movie and inspired to learn something code-related. So what did we do? I learned HTML, and I taught him how to do some basic web design. I learned a very small amount of what Linux was back then, but really did not turn down that road. But I was always intrigued from watching that movie. Fast forward some years later, and I remember my dad, always tech savvy, we built computers growing up, game together, etc., mentioned that he had tried out Linux and said it was a nightmare. I remember his specific complaint being that the amount of work he had to put into installing drivers for various hardware was such a hassle that he had to stop. Another few years pass and certain life events happen, but that itch hasn't been scratched, and I still remember that curiosity I had when I watched Hackers for the first time. Nearly two decades after such a naive moment that piqued my interest had passed, and I delved into Linux for the first time. One of the first things I did was dual boot Linux and Windows. After that, I've been in and out with Linux, distro hopping and trying new things. I feel like I'm trying to catch up to all this built-up curiosity that I never gave into. It has been a few years since the first time I ever booted into Linux, and I'm definitely late in the game with a lot to learn. Currently, I'm on a laptop which I bought specifically to use for Linux while I migrate completely. The curiosity I had in the beginning hasn't stopped. Thank you so much for sharing that story. It was awesome. I love the end, too. The curiosity that I had in the beginning hasn't stopped. I know how you feel. <laughs> I don't have enough time in the day to explore all of the suggestions that I receive and all the things that I want to experiment with and dabble in and, and install. And oh, man. Yeah, I totally get it. Stay curious, my friends. Stay curious. Every year in Cologne, Germany there is a conference devoted to open source musicians. And surrounding that event, there's also a challenge that goes on for one month. Last year's happened in September 2018, and it was the Open Source Music FM Synthesizer Challenge. Now, if you remember way back in episode two when I debuted Song from the Source, it was Rob Vandenberg with Penguin Polka. I'm very fond of that song still. And he did that with a single synthesizer. That's not an easy thing to do. I couldn't do it at all. It's like telling a, an electronic musician who has limitless tools and plugins and, and software at that disposal, use this one limited instrument. And it really brings out the imagination because you have to work within these, this confined space and you have to really bring that melody to the forefront. So I checked out the entries from last year's FM Synthesizer Challenge, and I picked out one by Lorenzo Sutton. The song is called Blue Star. Lorenzo describes it as an atmospheric, sci-fi-inspired synth track with classic FM sounds. And for this project, he used Rose Garden and Ardour, as well as a few different effects that seem to be mainly guitar-focused, which is interesting. But I picked this one because I just loved the melody. Melodies can be powerful, no matter what instrument they're being played with. So I hope you guys enjoy this one. It is Blue Star by Lorenzo Sutton. I will, as always, have a link to the song and to the artist over at linuxforeveryone.fireside.fm. And until we chat again next week, take care and take care of each other. Thanks for listening.